Welcome. Uh, I'm Bob and Osterhout. I've met you all, but uh, I've been teaching here at Lansing Community College since uh, 1976. Um, so I've been teaching a uh, course on, they actually, they asked me to develop a course in stress management back in 1981 and I've been teaching it ever since and online since 2001. Um, so uh, much of this material is, is in the course, although we'll be able to go into a little bit more depth uh, than, than I'm able to in the course since it's just a one credit class. Um, Mortimer Adler um, once defined a lecture as the process of taking what's in the notes of the instructor and putting it in the notes of the student without passing through the mind of either. <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna, I would like to avoid lecturing if I can. So please, uh, there's, there's kind of a sequence to the material and it's all logical and so forth, but so are your questions. So please don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, and if I forget where I was, one of you hopefully will remember, and if no one remembers, then it probably wasn't an important point anyway. So we'll, we'll just move on from there. Um, I worked as a, a psychologist and a, a licensed master social worker for about 40 years, uh, doing primary counseling. I also worked with a, a, an empowerment program for people in poverty. Um, and I had a, a professor as an undergraduate, it's actually a biology professor, uh, Dr. Ralph Lewis, who had a huge impact on my life, and I kept in touch with him for about 25 years after I, I finished school. But he challenged me to, uh, to continue to look for the underlying essential core principles of, that, uh, of what worked in, in what I was doing. Okay, so, so why does that work? How does it work? How can you summarize it in as few words as possible that are very easy to communicate? And then keep doing that. Okay, so you've got this. Now see if you can test it, okay, with experience, and then see if you can summarize it more. So that's basically what I've done throughout my whole career. And that's been uh, an incredible gift because it's really, I think, um, made a difference, a significant difference in my work. Uh, I worked a lot with uh, disadvantaged populations. Uh, I've worked with uh, profoundly and severely impaired, mentally impaired people and, and people in poverty. And actually across the board, because I, I worked in a rural area, so uh, worked with pretty much uh, all the conditions that you can imagine. Um, but there was kind of a, an emphasis on working with disadvantaged people. And people would come in and say, what's happening to me? And, you know, psychologists give these explanations like, well, um, you know, there's a chemical imbalance in your brain. Well, what does that mean? That sounds scary and doesn't make me feel good at all. Um, or something happened in your childhood, which, you know, sounds scary and doesn't help at all. So what I looked at is, is responding to, to Dr. Lewis's challenge. Um, well, what is happening? What's happening in your body? What's happening in your thoughts, in your mind? what's happening in your emotions, what's happening in your perceptions, what's going on? What, what is happening that's causing you this discomfort and what can we do about it? And let's figure out the, the common uh, core essential principles that underlie what you can do about it. So I didn't go to a lot of workshops uh, in psychological technique after I started practicing. I pretty much um, just kept fine-tuning what I found was effective in working with the people that I served. Um, and so uh, it's real common among psychologists to kind of have a toolbox and, and if this isn't working you, you lift this up and you try this tool. And uh, I'm interested in what is underlying those tools, okay? What's the common denominator that makes all of these tools work? Uh, and I actually came up with uh, four techniques that I've stayed with for the last uh, 25 years or so that pretty much uh, are all that I've needed in any of the work I've done. So I'm going to share those with you today. Um, the, the, the big problem with imbalance and with stress, and I, 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 I shifted to the term balance from stress because stress gets misinterpreted too much. People say there's good stress and bad stress and we can get into arguments about that. But balance, when we're out of balance, uh, it's pretty clear that we're not going to function as well as when we're in balance. But the problem with stress and the problem with imbalance is tension. Okay, there's physical, mental, and emotional tension. And tension also affects our perceptions. So we're going to look at how that works, okay, uh, what goes wrong, what works, and what health looks like. So those are the the, the, the four 
kind of questions that we're going to be answering in terms of physical, mental, and emotional balance, okay? And I break up the mental into thought and, and perception. Um, please interrupt me at any point if you have questions, if, if something's uh, uh, not clear, um, or if you think of something that might be helpful for others that I'm not covering at that point. Uh, just don't hesitate to, uh, to interrupt on that. Any questions so far? Okay. I have a, a couple questions for you. Okay. Um, how are you different when you have a lot of tension? Okay. And how are you different when you have less tension? And actually what I'd like to do is to have you talk among each other and, and, that, and then we'll kind of get a chance to reflect on that. Okay, is everybody ready to talk about what you've learned? Need more time? Okay. You gonna stay there? Huh? You gonna stay there? I don't mind when you're camera. No, no, wherever you're comfortable. I just. Uh, I don't know what the next question is. So oh, that's that's those are the only two questions so far. Oh, okay. So yeah, the re that's the only time that that it's structured in here for you to. I'm speaking for the time. The rest of the questions are for me because we can. While we're discussing this, okay. I want to find out what's going on with Kim over there. Okay. Okay. Um, so what did you learn? What is different? I think we have a lot in common in how we deal with stress. <laughs> yes. Okay. But what's uh, what's different about you when you have a lot of tension? What's different in your life? Chaotic and shut down at the same time. Okay. Everything's a big deal. Okay. Magnifies the, the issues and the problems. Okay. Reaction. The physical tightness in the body. Physical discomfort. Okay. Louder. Louder. Okay. We raise our voices. Good Talking point. Talking about being more curt or less accommodating of other people. Okay. When we're, we're under a lot of tension. Less accepting. Less patient. Okay. Um, for me, the really big thing that I notice, because I generally am a very creative person, and that goes away. Oh. Uh, Creativity just and then once dissipates. You're back in the balance, I have a long commute, so a lot of ideas will happen in my head if I'm in balance, but if I'm not in balance, there's nothing. Yeah. So then I have a pretty good idea. I'm back in balance when it's starting to get some pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, okay. I start looking right. more, and that's how I know when I'm back in balance. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I ask, I've asked my students this question. Um, boy, for 30 years. Um, and so this is just from, from this semester. Um, my shoulder, so this is what happens, the effects of, of when they have a lot of tension. Um, uh, my shoulders scrunch up to my ears, often creating a headache or a neck ache. My breathing becomes more shallow, and I have to remind myself to breathe deeply. My jaw tightens and my eyebrows come down without my noticing. Emotionally, I feel overwhelmed, often inadequate for everything that needs to be done. I also shift my moods very quickly, tend to have a short tempered, and feel exhausted. Okay? Much. Under tension, I do not perform as well. I usually clearly miss obvious important instructions, points, and information because of tension. I rush through things, trying to make up what I think is lost time. Usually my mental rushing ends up costing me more time because I significantly messed up something and have to start from the beginning or rework what I'd already done. I also tend to be more rigid in my thinking, not thinking about the consequences of my actions, which might impact my relationship with others. Okay? So tension ultimately is nasty. It, it undermines who we are and what we're able to do. Okay? What's different when you have less tension? Pardon? The opposite, the opposite of, of that, okay, <laughs> which is? Um, more social. Okay. More organized. I feel more organized, more okay. patient. Okay, that would make sense, yeah. More organized and social, patient. More energy. More energy, okay. Okay. Sleep better. Sleep better. <laughs> Any other comments? Well, I shared with the group here that normally in the classroom I feel, you know, pretty much level of flow and just get the material out and you know, respond to their needs. And a week ago when I got an accelerated second eight week class. And the first two weeks, 50% is getting A, about 30% is really D and F. I mean, mm. they, they haven't turned anything, they haven't done what they need to do or whatever. So 
I was kind of lambasted for about the first 10 minutes of that third class when I was thinking, okay, 50% of the class doesn't need that lecture. They mm -hmm. don't have any need to hear about the non-performance and mm -hmm. they're doing what they're supposed to do. And, you know, so I was kind of, voice was raised and that type of stuff. And, you know, I don't know if it got through because mm -hmm. those are always the ones that are hardest sometimes to reach. Uh, and so I thought about it that following weekend when I finished grading the work that was due, you know, for the weekend. I said, you know, here's the score distribution. You know where you're at. I'm not going to talk about this in class anymore because mm -hmm. half the class doesn't need it. So right. why am I spending time? And you've got to turn your voice a little bit more somber and, and yeah. just, you put on a different face when you're kind of, you know, right. saying, hey, get, you, get it in gear. Yeah. Because half the class doesn't need to get there. They are in gear. So, yeah. You know, that whole situation of, you know. Yeah. So tension drives us to act without thinking. Mm -hmm. And when we have less tension, we can stop and think right. and say, is that going to help or, you know, what's, what's going on? Yeah. Here's some of the comments from my students. Without tension, I'm a much more pleasant person. I breathe deeply, feeling refreshed and empowered. When I'm relaxed, in this way, I'm, I more easily combat stressors, brushing off minor inconveniences. When I have less tension, I'm able to work through assignments and tasks with smooth, efficient, high-quality effort. I tend to think more about the consequences of a decision and am much more empathic toward others. I'm also much more relaxed and enjoyable to be around when I'm not under a lot of tension. When I'm less tense, I feel, feel I can accomplish a lot during my day. I'm happy and patient with my family, even if something doesn't go as planned. I feel I can handle it with ease. So balance gives you a much longer fuse. Lack of balance, which is basically tension, really shortens the fuse and, and messes everything else up as well. Um, Hello. Hello. Welcome. You are? Uh, Shannon Lindbeck. Diane? Oh, Shannon. Welcome. Here, let's just sign in. I'll get you in. Here's a handout for you. We're being uh, videotaped, but your comments are not. So we're, I'm going to be using this for my class, and so others can watch it. Uh -huh. um, but they'll be editing out, and, and there won't be any pictures taken of any of the participants. So yeah, go ahead and have a seat. Thanks for joining us. Okay, uh, all of the, um, the material in one form or another is in the handout, okay? So uh, there's not a big need to take notes unless there's something you particularly want to remember. I'm not going to follow the handout. There may be information in the handout that I won't touch on. I'm going to be more describing uh, how it works uh, uh, from experience and giving you stories and things like that about how that happened. Uh, but this is all here. And the front page uh, pretty much uh, sums up a lot of, of what's um, wrong with getting out of balance and what happens to us. Um, just a couple other comments on that. Um, there was a Gallup survey from 2000 to 2012, and they found that uh, out of 100 million full-time U.S. workers, 30% were engaged and inspired in their work, 30%. 20% are actively disengaged. The quote was, these employees roam the halls spreading discontent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they create stress and imbalance for everybody else. That's 20% of the American workforce. Okay. 70% of American workers are disengaged from their work. Quote, meaning they're emotionally disconnected from their workplaces and less likely to be productive. Unquote. They estimate the cost and lost productivity at $550 billion per year and the poor, plus the poor quality of work and the lost time in terms of, of health and, and other consequences of that. Um, so balance is a big deal, okay? Uh, the Business Roundtable compared um, people working 40 to 60 hours a week in the same task, and part of them went up to 60. Some of them stayed, the rest stayed at 40. And this is, again, a quote. The fall-off can be seen within days, is obvious in a week, and after two months, you're actually further ahead if you just stuck to 40 hours a week all, all along. So after two months, the people working 40 hours accomplished more than those who went up to 60 hours, even though they were working half again as much. Okay? And plus those other people had all of the, the disadvantages that you just described from the build of attention that, re, that re, results from a lack of balance. And people say, well, I work better under pressure and I need that to get motivated. And actually, uh, that tends not to be true. Uh, the U.S. Army did a study 
uh, where they had uh, combat conditions and uh, the radio, the people whose job it was to repair the radios thought it was an actual combat situation. Okay, they'd been trained in this uh, over years, okay, and they had to fix these radios and their efficiency went way down. It took two to three times longer to do the same repair when they were under high stress than when they were in balance, okay? All of that is simply a myth because one of the, the main things that happens when we lose balance is we lose awareness that we're losing effectiveness. We lose awareness that we're out of balance, okay? So we don't know it, okay? I used to call it delusions of adequacy, okay? We think we know what's, what's going on, but we don't, okay? Questions? I worked with a man who had been in seclusion for 30 years. He had actually been held in restraints in a straitjacket almost continually for three years. Okay, this was back in the 70s and um, he was in a residential facility and um, every time they let him go or untied him, he just attacked, every time. Okay, so they just, I mean, they, they actually, really sadly, fed him like a dog. They opened his door, put his food on the floor, closed it up, and, and he ate in his straitjacket. They would hose him off every couple of weeks to give him a shower. It was really a sad situation. He, he was, the, the state of Michigan came up with uh, a mental health code in the 70s and it became illegal to do this. You can't keep someone tied up, you know, continually, okay, and you can't keep them in seclusion continually. Uh, so they brought him up to the facility where I happened to be working because we had a small psychiatric unit and they wanted to see if there was a, a drug evaluation that they could do, find something to settle him down enough so they could at least, you know, let him out once in a while. And they asked me to consult because I had a lot of experience working with people with violence, okay, and helping them to calm down and, and to, to move in a healthy direction. So uh, I spent about an hour practicing the techniques that I'm going to share with you uh, a little bit later, okay, so that I was not out of balance when I went in there. And uh, in the process of bringing him into the building, uh, there were 700 staff, and the facility director um, got the four biggest, strongest men, okay, to escort this guy from the, the vehicle into his room. And there was a row of windows about this height, and he was maybe 120 pounds, small and wiry, about five six, not not a huge guy. Uh, he put out three of those windows with his feet on the way into the in the, in the building. Okay, so I opened the door and I stepped through and I made sure I was closer to the door than he was to me, okay? But I also stood in a non-threatening stance, okay? And this was just what I found worked, okay? Actually, the Department of Mental Health told us to come in like this, but this is saying, fight me, okay? And this is saying, I'm not gonna hurt you. It's more of a balanced stance, because I can't strike a blow from this position. I can move quickly to, to deal with a situation either side if I have to, but it, so it's a, it's a balanced position. And he was pacing on the other, back and forth on the other side of the room, just ignoring me. So I introduced myself and explained why I was there and what was going on. And um, I was trying to get a sense of, of what it was like to be in his skin. And I'd, I was drawn to the amount of tension in his head and neck. He just, just, I've never seen that much tension in a person before in my life. And I was convinced he must have a really bad headache, okay? So I, I just mentioned that. I said, I'm wondering if you've got a headache. Uh, and I mentioned that I, that I work with tension and sometimes I can help people get rid of headaches and if you want to sit on your bed, you know, I'll see if I can help. I don't know if it'll work, but I'll give it a try. And he sat down. And that was the first time anyone knew he had language. Uh, because you can't evaluate a guy, okay, uh, that, that attacks you all the time. They didn't know if he was schizophrenic, they didn't know if he was mentally impaired, they didn't know if he knew English or had any language. They knew nothing, okay. Uh, but he did sat down and I worked on him, had no effect whatsoever. And I sat down next to him and talked for a while and he didn't look at me or acknowledge me. And when I couldn't think of anything else to say, I got up and walked out. And there was a whole crowd of people looking through the little window <laughs> kind of see what was going to happen. And the nurse who had admitted him was saying, this never happened. He always attacks. And there was a brand new staff person. The guy was 19 years old. He just finished, tra finished training. I'd never seen him before. And he said, that's nothing. And he opened the door, walked in, sat next to him on the bed, talked to him, and also was not attacked. Okay? He put his finger exactly on what worked. Nothing. No tension. Okay? For 30 years, every human contact this man had was with someone who was out of balance because they were expecting a fight. 
okay? All of a sudden, twice in one day, two guys come in not expecting a fight, who are more in balance, and he doesn't fight. That's the power of balance. That's how much we can miss when we're out of balance. I mean, those were all well-intentioned people, okay, who were working with him and, and they had compassion for him, but they were expecting a fight and their fear escalated his fear, which escalated their fear, and now you're off to the races, okay? So that complicates everything, okay? So, yes? Do you mind if I add that um, I heard him at a conference a few years back and so I've tried that just a couple times with students that have come in and they're all like really wound up. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily threatening, but they're, and I just sit there and I do some of the grounding, balancing yeah. techniques and it's amazing to watch them calm down. When, when someone, that's a really good point, thank you for bringing it up, because calm overrides tension if you can maintain the calm. I've worked with people with violence most of my career, okay, and in every situation remaining calm was the answer. Um, uh, at that uh, the job that I was describing, I, I was responsible for a unit that had, <clears throat> excuse me, that had uh, 26 men, all of whom had problems with violence. So the rest of the, the facility didn't have any problems because they sent everybody with problems to this one building. And they were all in one room that was actually just about the size of this room. Okay, so you can imagine. <laughs> Uh, they were averaging 30 to 35 incidents a week where they had to go in and, and use a basket hole to hold someone to stop them from hurting each other or themselves or breaking up the place, okay? Um, and my office was on the other side of the wall from, the, from that room, so I said, if you need help, you know, let me know, and they would try to call me, but the phone, of course, was in a cage, <laughs> okay, a locked cage, so, you know, you've got chaos going around you that's escalating, and you've got to take your keys out of here and open up the cages. Okay, tell you what, just knock on the wall three times. If I hear three knocks, I'll know you need help, and I'll come and help you, okay? And this is exactly what I would do in real time uh, whenever that happened, okay? So I'm sitting at my desk, okay, and doing something or other, and I hear the knock on the wall, so I turn in my chair, okay? And this is what I did every time. <sighs> Meanwhile, I might hear a chair hit the wall or something. But. take my keys out of my pocket and go through my door and go through that door and walk in. And after a couple of weeks, just walking in was enough to settle things down most of the time, okay? Um, because they knew at that point I wasn't going to attack them, that they were safe, okay? So balance undermines the escalation of tension, and that's just a highly efficient way of of restoring balance in a, in a quick way, okay? Um, there was another psychologist, uh, when I wasn't there, uh, came running down the hall to help out, burst through the door, and got his jaw broken, <laughs> okay? That didn't help anybody, including him, <laughs> okay? And, and the clinic I used to work for, I worked at a medical clinic up north, we'd have a code 88 whenever there was a potentially violent incident, and people would go rushing, you know, down there. I always just slowly, and as I'm walking, I'm focusing on restoring my balance so that when I get there, okay, now we can assess the situation because charging in narrows everything down and, and makes it more difficult. Okay, makes it, makes it much, much harder. Okay, so here's the summary of what we're gonna be covering the rest of the day, okay? How it works, okay? Um, when everything is working, mind, body, emotions, perceptions, thoughts, are interacting and each is feeding each other in a healthy way. So we're, we're, our awareness is, is all around us. We have good peripheral vision. We're taking in a lot of information, okay? And, and there's a good interaction between those components, okay? Uh, what goes wrong basically is tension, okay? 
tension, physical, mental, emotional tension, tension in terms of perceptions is going to make everything more difficult. What works is restoring and maintaining balance using what I believe to be natural methods. Those are the, that's what, ha what I learned over the decades of trying to fine tune, okay, why does this work? Okay, how come it didn't work here? What can I do to help that? And how does that happen? And, and gradually breaking it down to its simplest core principles. And so we're gonna give you, gonna give you four things as well as, as some concepts about perception that I found to be consistently uh, helpful over the time. And then what health looks like. And basically in a healthy, balanced state, we can be completely ourselves. Okay, all of our personal resources then are available and we're aware of what's going on around us. We can anticipate what might happen. We've learned from the past and we're producing the energy we need for the situation. What happens when we're out of balance is we're producing more energy than what we need in the situation. And that's what tension comes from. Tension is holding back the impulse to act. Okay, so, so we're producing more than can we use and that interferes with our mind, emotions, body, perceptions, all of that. Okay, any questions about where we're going? Okay, let's start. Okay, um, this is an artificial breakdown. We are one person, okay, and it's very important to interact with someone as a whole person and we tend to separate it for convenience and I've done the same thing because it's much easier to explain when it's broken down into parts but it's important to remember uh, that we are simply one whole person okay and that the components um, that I found helpful to to understand um, are body and we always start with body I'll get to that uh, explanation in a little bit perception emotion and thought and each one feeds the other okay now there's an interesting thing there, there's a book out called uh, think fast and slow by a man named Kahneman and um, on the left side there uh, body perception and emotion can be right away okay we can react to something before we think about it thought is slow thought slows us down Thinking involves language and that slows us down, okay? Um, to the extent we're thinking about what we're doing, we're not doing it very well. It actually interferes with the process. I remember um, catching a, an interview about a baseball game and, and I, I'm not a big fan, but I happened to be walking by and this guy was being interviewed. Apparently he got the game running hit for a championship game. And the guy asked him, what were you thinking before you hit the ball? And he said, I wasn't thinking. If I'd been thinking, I wouldn't have hit it, <laughs> okay, which is exactly true. And I remember my daughter uh, ran the hurdles in high school, and her coach was challenging her to, to break the record, and, and there was this one race. I don't know if she beat the gun, but she just burst out ahead of everybody and, and was almost a full hurdle ahead of everybody, and it was like, whoa. And, and she said she got to the last hurdle, and she says, I've just got to make sure I don't fall. <laughs> Down she went because her thought interfered with her response to the moment, okay? So when we're in balance, we can respond to the moment with our full capacity. When we're thinking about it, it throws us out of balance. Now thought serves a usual purpose, okay? But we need to do it in context where it's gonna be helpful. We need to reflect on things and learn from things and obviously the college wouldn't exist if, if we <laughs> didn't emphasize thought, so. Um, Okay. Oops, I'm gonna go back. Oh, did I miss one here? Oh, okay. Um, in terms of the components um, of uh, body, my, body perception, emotion, and thought, uh, the one part that's not up there is brain. And actually, I, I got very interested in neuroscience and just thought, wow, this is going to really inform my work and, and confirm things. And the more I looked into it, uh, the more skeptical I became, uh, particularly when I came across a quote from uh, a group of neuroscience that wrote a letter to the European agency that was coordinating the new developments in neuroscience. And this man said, drawing conclusions from neuroscience at this stage of its development is the equivalent to hearing thunder 
and predicting where the lightning will strike. Okay? We know how lightning works, we know how thunder works, but to use it as a predictive tool, we ain't there yet. <laughs> okay? And some of this stuff is so interesting and so exciting, it's very tempting to jump ahead, and a lot of people, particularly a lot of psychologists, tend to do that, but we need to have some skepticism about that. Okay? Um, it, it's pretty clear, um, in my perspective, that the medical breakthroughs are going to come first. Okay? The psychological benefits of understanding how the brain works, probably I don't imagine it happening in my lifetime. From, from my understanding of, of the work that's, that's being done and what we're capable of. Um, first of all, there, there, there's no evidence that any particular part of the brain causes a particular behavior. That's just a huge jump to put that cause in there. And uh, there, was a, there was a man, um, there was a thing on PBS a few years back, and there was a man who was, who was very physically active. He was a jogger, he was an athlete, and he was in his 50s and uh, had a stroke. It's a very severe stroke. Doctors said he would never walk again. Um, his son was just starting medical school and he dropped out of medical school to help his father. And he said, um, you know, you learned how to walk by crawling first, so let's start there. You learned how to do it one time, let's just try it. What have we got to lose? So he worked with his father for a couple of years, starting out crawling, okay? and eventually got him up on his feet and he was able to walk again and he was able to run again and he got back into jogging. He wasn't completely back to where he was but he was very active and had a full life and lived another 20 years and, and then he died. And his son by then had graduated from medical school. He went back and he requested a full autopsy and the part of the brain that's involved in walking and running was not there. It was mush. Okay, it was not functional. Okay, he had reworked new pathways to compensate for that. Okay, so the brain is an adaptive organ. Okay, it isn't a fixed thing. It isn't like a computer where this processor does this and this handles that. Um, it adapts, and, and people who have visual impairment find other parts of the brain that are much larger, okay, and, 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 and so we adapt to, to what's going on there. So uh, to say that, that um, you know, this part of the brain causes this it, it is based really on the major research is really measuring blood flow in the brain, okay. They use a, an FR, fMRI that measures, measures blood flow and they also kind of measure some electrical current, okay. Uh, but to say that because there's blood flow in this part of the brain that's causing this behavior is the equivalent of saying that embarrassment is caused by blushing. Okay? It's not caused by blushing. It's caused by me thinking I'm stupid or something like that. Okay? Um, and, but, it's, but there's a corresponding thing that's happening in the brain which makes sense because the brain is really the coordinator in, in my understanding of it. So I, I think of it less as a master and more as a coordinator. So we won't be looking at a lot from the brain. We hear the term hard, hardwired a lot, and I think that's a misnomer uh, because the brain continually adapts to what's going on. And, and I can speak from personal experience because I also had a stroke uh, back in 2009. It was a, actually one of the most fascinating experiences I've ever had. Um, uh, but I could feel my brain shutting down. I could feel language shutting down. And it was like I was going down this slope and I wanted to go there because it was really, there was something really intriguing about it. And I was at work and I went down to urgent care and got checked out and they called an ambulance and when I was waiting for the ambulance I just sat down and was meditating. And they, they uh, put me in the ambulance and strapped me down and um, then when they were, sirens were blaring and they were passing everyone I realized, oh, well, I could die. And so I'm thinking, well, there's not much I can do about that. But I felt this slipping away and then I realized language is the key to my work. Okay, I need language. So I started doing mental math and started, started um, uh, just five times nine divided by four times three and just, just to occupy my brain to get it going from some reason I thought of that and then I started repeating phrases and sounds and things like that and I could feel part of my body so I just started moving and I was strapped down. So I did that all the way to the hospital. It was about uh, a 40-minute drive because it's far up north. And um, 
they asked me to sign my name when we got to the hospital, hand me a clipboard, and it's like, it wasn't there. It's like I went to a river and the bridge was out, okay, and I could not do it. And I had to practice and practice and practice for hours, and then I eventually could sign my name. They asked me who the president was, and I said John Kennedy. And I knew it was wrong, but it was the same thing. It was like I went to the river and the bridge was out. So then I had to go through the presidents, and I finally got to the current president. Okay, so and I fully recovered by doing that, but it, it taught me an important lesson about how our brain really works. It's not like a computer. That's really not a very good example of what the brain is. So, so I encourage you to take um, all of that with a little bit of skepticism. But there is something that, that we understand about the brain that actually people started talking about in the 90s that I found to be extremely valuable. And that is, is that, our, that our brain um, records, not so much records, that's not the word I want, um, reflects our experiences by creating pathways, by creating connections between neurons. That's pretty well known. And, and uh, I mean, the, the infinite number of connections available is, is outstanding. The number is bigger than what I can write on that board over there, okay? The possible connections and the way they do. But so when I saw each of you come in, okay, for example, I recognized you because I have a series of connections in my brain from Pam, okay? Because we've talked a number of times, and so when, as soon as you walked in, that's Pam. You're probably wearing different clothes than when I met you before, and your glasses may be different, and I don't know, but I recognize you because we've had a lot of, of contact before. So anytime we have an experience, it creates a connection between a series of neurons. And then to the extent we repeat that experience, it becomes easier to access. And the more often we access it, the easier it is to find. So if you've lived in your home for any length of time, you won't have to think about how to get home tonight. Okay, you can just think about what you want for dinner or what you want to do afterwards, uh, and you'll wind up at home. Okay, if I'm going to go to your homes, I don't know where any of you live, I'll have to follow directions and look at road signs and, and figure it out, okay, because my brain doesn't have those pathways, okay. So that's an important part of our understanding, and that's the extent that we'll be talking about how the brain influences that in terms of those roadways and pathways, okay. Any questions? Okay. So that's one part of how it works, okay. Uh, I'm going to start with the body. Uh, because that's the most important in my mind. It's the most important, it's because where we start. The body seems to influence the others more than the other way around. It's more difficult to change, to bring about change working with perception, thought, and emotion if there's tension building in the body uh, than if you get tension out of the body. And I'll explain that uh, as, we, as we move on. But just to give you the, the uh, essential components, Okay, it's obviously not the whole picture that would take a couple semesters to, to go into, but this is the, the basis of, of what matters in terms of maintaining and restoring balance. Okay? So the, the key factor in the body is the autonomic nervous system. Okay? It's the part of your nervous system that regulates where energy goes in your body. And it either goes one or two places. It goes to the muscles for movement or activity, or it goes to your internal organs for maintenance. Okay? Those two parts of the autonomic nervous system work opposite each other. Okay? You don't eat a big, huge meal and then go out and run a marathon. Okay? You're going to find the meal and probably end yourself laying alongside the road if you do that. <laughs> okay? um, when one is on, actually the other is suppressed. They're never both on at the same time. Okay? So this balance is when you need the activity, okay, your body produces the energy, and when you don't, you're doing maintenance. Okay? You need the activity again, Okay, I'm doing some stuff, okay, now it's time for lunch, now I'm going to do maintenance and digest some lunch. You go back and forth throughout the day and, and that's how it works, okay. In terms of perception, I found it helpful to think of in terms of three components, frame, filter, and focus, okay. The frame, okay, just like we have some frames here of, of pictures on the wall, okay, the frame defines our experience and conceptual understanding, okay? So I, I, I had a picture on the wall of my office of the moon rising over the ocean, okay? So here's a picture, and you can see the moon rising over the ocean. And I would show it to people, and I'd say, there could be a boat over here, but we don't see it, okay? There could some, be someone drowning over here, but we don't see it, because this frame limits our view of that scene, just as our frames 
limit what we believe to be part of our reality. Okay? And what's happened in our political situation, and it's been done intentionally because there are articles describing this and books describing how they could not and did do it, create frames that don't overlap. Okay? So if this is my frame, the people in this frame are stupid, ignorant, or evil, or all three, okay? and vice versa. And that's why we can't get anything done because we've separated into these frames and they don't overlap. Um, and so uh, what we want is a flexible frame. Okay? So if I meet someone who has an experience different than mine, my frame becomes a little bit larger. And I meet someone else and it becomes a little bit larger. Okay? So it can expand uh, to take in more information. Okay? The filter is the emotional component. Okay? That's uh, what's happening emotionally. That colors our experience. Okay? So if I'm really sad and discouraged, uh, telling me to cheer up, I'm not going to hear it. Telling me what a great person I am and how I should just do this, yeah, right, okay. Um, you know that that doesn't work, those of you who are in counseling. It just simply doesn't work. You can't talk someone into that. Okay? It colors. It's like wearing dark glasses. Okay? You just don't see it. And on the other side of it, if I'm wearing rose-colored glasses, I'm probably not going to see the red light. Okay, so, so your emotions, it's, it's, a, it's an analogy from, from photography. So you put a filter over a camera lens and it changes the color of the picture and changes how you see it and what you see. Okay, so those emotions will, will change that. Okay, so I worked with a guy um, who came in with a problem. Uh, he had a really good friend that he'd known for like 20 years and they went on a trip together and they got into a big argument about the finances and couldn't agree on one thought one was fair and the other thought the other was fair and they had these two separate ways of looking at it. And I asked him, you know, well, how much money is it and what's your financial situation, you know, how big of a deal is this? And he said, well, you know, not really. And I asked him, well, how important is the relationship? How, how long have you known him? And, and, you know, do you value the friendship? And, you know, have you always gotten along before? Yeah, we've been great friends and he's done wonderful things for me. Well, you know, is this or worth it? Okay. And he realized no. And he wrote a very carefully worded letter that basically said, uh, sent him an email actually, that said, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry we got into this disagreement and I'm just going to go along with whatever you decide is fair because we've had a good relationship for this many years and you've always been a good friend and I'm sorry for the problems that I caused in this. And he got an incredibly angry email back from his friend. <laughs> okay. It's like, whoa, where did that come from? And he brought it in and says, how did this happen? And I said, send him an email, tell him to reread your last email. Okay. The guy looked at it with a filter and just picked out the parts that could make him more angry. And that's all he saw. Okay. He did not see it. Okay. It's that powerful. Okay. The focus is what we pay attention to. Okay, and that, by default, becomes our priority. Okay? So if I'm uh, focusing on whether my shoes are tied, it's a hard time for me to focus on what's happening here with the rest of you. Okay? And you're going to all get up and leave pretty quickly. Okay? Um, and, our, and our focus gets pulled. Okay? Back in the, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, when I first started teaching, um, the, the data was that there were about 2,000 things at any given moment that your mind could be pulled through throughout the day. Okay, now it's up to 10,000. Okay, just, just demands on our attention in terms of the, the stimulation and the advertising and everything that's pulling us and, and that you can focus on. Um, and so the focus is something that needs to adapt to the situation and the conditions. Okay, so the way it works is our focus shifts depending on what's happening and what's important. Okay, so that's how perception works. Okay, thought, uh, we talked about thought is, is internal language or images. Okay, and it's, it's kind of the running commentary that we have. And uh, where it's really helpful in terms of reflecting on, my, on our experience. Okay, so I've, I've given this presentation a few times before and I reflect on that. Spent some time thinking about it last night. Okay, what went well? What could I have done better? So that thought hopefully will make this into a better more effective presentation. So that's, that's where our mind contributes to that is, is and we can plan, we can discern, we can analyze. Um, but it's important to remember that thought is either the past or the future. It's virtually impossible to think about the present moment 
because it takes us away from it. If there's an abstraction there by turning it into language. Okay, thought is different than experience. And we have to be a little bit careful about that because our concepts can override our experience. And the way we, and that creates the frame. So our concept can create a frame, okay, uh, that overrides that. So, um, but the, the way it works is that the thought affects the perception, is affected by the perception, the thought affects the body, is affected by the body, and the thought affects emotion, and is affected by emotion. Okay? So emotion, first of all, is experienced in the body. That's an important part to remember. It's actually a physical experience. There are literally movements in your muscles that can be observed and even measured if you have the proper equipment when people are experiencing different emotions. It's a physical experience. Okay? There's movement in the muscles. Okay? It also changes with perception. Your emotion is totally dependent on where your focus is. Okay? Uh, think of a funeral. Okay? Someone close to me has died. I'm, I'm going in, I'm feeling sad and alone and, and just kind of lost and, and you know, I meet other people and someone tells a funny story and we all laugh and I feel a sense of connection with everyone else who, who love this person and that changes that feeling. Okay? And then when I think about them again, I feel sad again. So, so the emotions actually last a fraction of a second. They can change that quickly. So people ask, well, wait a minute, you know, uh, and I can speak from experience. When my parents died, you know, there was a sadness that continued for a good year or so. But each time it was stimulated by something else. So I would, I would go to call them to tell them something and it's like, oh, they're not there. And I'd feel sad. Okay. Um, so it depends on what you're paying attention to. So if you're focused, if, you, if you're in a situation where the emotion interferes with dealing with the situation, you shift your focus and the emotion changes. So um, back uh, when I lived in Lansing in the, in the 70s, I, I did some training for the EMT uh, when they were first getting the program uh, together. And I, uh, they allowed me to drive with the, or ride along with the EMTs on, on their runs to get a sense of what that experience was. And there was a guy who, uh, there was a young woman, a yellow girl, who had been really severely injured and they didn't know if she was going to make it. And she looked a lot like and was the same age as this guy's daughter. Okay, and he had that experience like, oh my God, but then he focused on, you know, getting her stable and what needed to be done and everything was fine. He did a beautiful job, got her to the ER, and then he had to cry afterwards. It's like, oh my God, that could have been my daughter and her parents. I know what they're feeling like. Okay, so, so when he brought his focus back to that, then the emotion came. And if we don't bring the focus back, then it gets locked in and that's a, another piece about what goes wrong. Okay? So there's three functions to emotion. Okay? Functions that they serve from, from my understanding. Okay? It's an overall assessment of the motion, of the, of the moment. Okay? And, and the, the general assessment is, is, is it safe or unsafe? Okay? But, but there's, it's, it's more nuanced than that. Okay, but it just gives you an overall impression, okay, it, it, without analyzing it or using words. It's like, okay, what's happening here? And any emotion can be traced to that overall experience or assessment. One of the other functions it serves is to connect us with other people because we all share the same basic emotions. Darwin actually discovered this and, and, and wrote a book on it. And, and I remember, you know, in training and, and people saying, oh, you can't know what it's like to, to, you know, to be in war if you hadn't been in war. Um, I disagree with that. I, I've worked with probably 100 or more people who've been in war and I can feel their feelings and they're the same among, I mean, there are different variations, but the basic emotions uh, in going through those varied experiences are essentially the same. Okay, the, the terror, the fear, the regret, those are all human emotions that we all share. And when we connect with those emotions, we connect with those around us too. Okay? And that's where people get stuck in, in therapy sometimes, okay? because that feeling of connection feels good. Okay? So if someone understands what I'm feeling and feels what I'm feeling, I feel better afterwards. But if we don't do anything about it, okay, I feel better for a little while and then it comes back. So you can keep someone in treatment for a long time. It also connects the action with the needs of the moment. Okay? So if I see a threat, I've got a burst of energy to deal with it. Okay? If, if, um, 
there's a loss and I'm sad, that's going to tend me toward reflection, which is a part of the process of mourning and letting go of, of, of what I've lost. Okay, so it slows me down, it speeds me up, it connects with what's, what's happening. So emotion really is a connecting experience. Okay, connects us with what's happening around us through our body, okay, in, in those ways. Okay, and again, the fast, the body's reaction, the emotional reaction, um, they're happening before you can think about it. Okay, uh, it, it's, it's, it's quick and then the, and the, the, uh, the thought slows it down. Okay, so there's three kinds of emotion. This is another important thing that's helpful to keep in mind. Okay? Natural emotion is what I've been describing. It's just a response to what's happening to the moment, to my overall perception of the moment. Okay? And again, that lasts a fraction of a second, as I explained, or can. Okay? The second part is mental emotion. That comes from thought. Okay? And I can keep that going as long as I keep thinking about that. And in general, um, uh, that tends to be a less than helpful emotion if you continue it because you can create a recycling thing. We're talking about the emotion that stimulates the same emotion. And I saw that in working with PTSD and a lot of people had been in the, through the, the VA which had a protocol uh, of you had to talk about what happened, okay, the trauma. And what I realized is that those people were being re-traumatized by being forced to talk about it, okay, and, and that talking about it was only helpful to the extent that you could put it into context and understand it. But as soon as I saw someone increasing tension talk about it, uh, we would stop. Okay, uh, and I actually um, worked with many people who never talked about their traumatic experiences and fully recovered. Uh, one of the one of the first people I worked with in that area was a woman. Uh, she had been um, she'd had 17 years of counseling, and was seeing her counselor three times a week um, before she came in to see me, and. Um, we had to do an assessment at the uh, history at the, at the clinic where I was working at that time where he had to go through all of this list of stuff and he had to answer every question. And so I was completing that because you had to. And I could see that she was going to break down right in front of me if I continued asking those questions. It was pretty clear that I was going to have to hospitalize her if I completed that. So I just set it aside. Okay. And we talked about, okay, what's going on right now? Okay. And actually what was going on, the main issue, <laughs> there's a lot of issues going on, but at that moment, the issue was laundry. She hadn't done laundry in three months. She was trying to hold her life together and had a professional job and was able to hold it together during her job. Uh, but when she got home, it was like, ah, and she just couldn't organize herself. She kept, she was making a lot of money, so she kept on buying new clothes. Okay, and her roommate was getting really frustrated because her room was just full of dirty, I mean, you can imagine. Okay, so it's like laundry. Okay, well, let's deal with that. Let's figure out how to organize so you can at least get started doing some laundry in a realistic way. Okay, so we restored some balance and made a plan to work that out and fine tune it over time. She got all her laundry done and her roommate threw her out anyway. Uh, so then she had to find a place to live and we worked on that and she had to buy furniture and she was uncomfortable doing that. We figured out how to do that. Every time the emotions come up, we'd restore balance. She learned how to restore balance with all this stuff that came up. And then um, she met a guy, ironically enough, in the laundromat <laughs> um, <laughs> who, uh, who showed, a, showed an interest yeah, showed an interest in her and freaked out at that. It's like, oh my God. So we had to deal with those emotions. Okay, let's just slow down, balance. Okay, here's where it is. Here's where you don't want to go. Here's where you're comfortable. Let's stay within that. Slowly worked it out. Um, and then uh, she got a job offer like an hour and a half away, which is a really good job, and she couldn't turn it down. So she took the job and she was driving, you know, three hours. I had to take a half day off work. And it's like, wait a minute, you know, you're doing pretty well. How about if you call me, if you have questions, if I don't hear from me, I'll call you every two weeks. And she was fine. She wound up marrying a guy and, and you know, I didn't hear for, from her after keeping in touch for six or nine months, something like that. I never knew what the trauma was. Didn't need to. Okay, okay. That was, that was all mental, emotional things that were building up. The third time of kind of emotion is structural emotion. And that's when we use tension to block the experience of emotion. And that's what we were working through, actually, with every time tension would come up. Okay, how do you restore balance? 
and should restore that balance. We come up and restore balance. Okay, so structural emotion comes from when we try to stop emotion, or it can just come from stress because since emotions experienced in the body, when I have tension in my muscles, they won't work. Okay, so some of you mentioned I'm, I'm not as empathic when I'm stressed, or I'm not, you know, uh, as emotionally in tune when I'm stressed. Of course you're not, because the emotions aren't as receptive because they're blocked by the tension. Okay, so that tension is the structural emotion, and that's that's what uh, keeps that going. So questions about um, how it works. It's an ongoing interaction. On your handout, you also have attitude and motivation. Yeah, I didn't put that into the presentation because it's not relevant to balance. Okay. If, if you want to uh, have more of a comprehensive psychological <laughs> study of it, that's another kind of emotion, but it's not relevant to our discussion, okay. so I didn't put it in there. Okay. So that, that's, that's why. But thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, do you all need a break? Who needs a break? You want to take uh, five minutes? Is that okay? Bye. Let's take a five-minute break, and then we'll go to the next uh, the next part. So we're ready to start again. Um, so what's everybody ready? What's happening here is that the body is producing just the right amount of energy for all this to deal with whatever is happening around us. Okay, and all of that is very nicely regulated and it's a very interesting and sophisticated process. But this is kind of how it works in a nutshell. So the next question is, what goes wrong? Okay, and what goes wrong is that we get into crisis mode. Okay, and <laughs> Okay, now this is what happens in crisis mode. Okay, see what I did? I got a shot of energy, okay, that didn't fit the situation. Okay, so I need to let that down and restore it. Okay, so crisis mode is like being chased by a bear. Okay, you don't think about where you're going. Okay, you don't plan ahead. Okay, all you're focused on is get away from, see, I did it again get away from the bear, okay? Um, and that's all that matters. Everything else in the body, mind, perception, emotion shuts down so that the survival mechanisms can keep you alive, okay? Any non-essential thing, creativity, gone. No creativity when you're being chased by a bear, okay? So let's, uh, let's get rid of that bear, okay? Um, <laughs> <laughs> See, I did it again. Okay, I let the shoulders down, my fist clench, knees bend. See, everything pulled up, immediate burst of tension. Okay, let it down. <sighs> Open up my breathing again, because my breathing came up. Okay, that's what happens to our body in crisis mode. Okay? Now, have you tried that technique like you did with the patient? With the uh, bears yourself? No, no, no. Never, never artificially. There's, there's enough. There's a never, never been a shortage of stuff to deal with that I've had to do that. So <laughs> there's, there's always enough there. Okay. So we don't never do anything artificial, or with my students either, for that matter. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't play that trick. To myself, that's okay. Okay. So we've got the same diagram there um, of the interaction between perception, body, emotion, and thought. Uh, but what's happening is each is escalating tension in the other and limiting the other, okay? So you've got a self-escalating process, okay? So we'll start again with the body, okay? Because that, that in a sense drives the whole reaction. So we're back to the autonomic nervous system, the two parts. Sympathetic nervous system gets stuck on because all the energy is going to the muscles. You don't need to digest lunch when being chased by a bear. Forget about lunch get away from the bear, okay? You don't need to take a rest if you get tired when you're being chased by the bear. You're not gonna be able to say, okay, hey, uh, let's uh, pause for a minute, let me catch my breath, okay, and then we can go again. No, by the time you're lunch then at that point, okay? So this gets stuck on, okay? And our body has mechanisms to keep that going. So when I get tired and the bear is, is gaining on me, uh, stress hormones will give me an extra burst of adrenaline and energy so I can keep going. The problem is, is if I'm sitting at my desk worried about what's going to happen, 
the same thing is happening. I'm producing energy that, that is interfering with my ability to function. Okay? And we can get stuck in crisis mode and not know that that's what our life has become because it diminishes our awareness of what's happening. And it all starts really with this imbalance in the nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system gets stuck on. The parasympathetic, which is responsible for your body's maintenance, isn't getting enough energy, so what happens? Your digestion gets messed up, you can't sleep, um, all kinds of things start going wrong, you're not fighting, fighting off disease, you get a cold more easily, all kinds of health problems can result from that. Um, and having worked in a medical clinic, I could see the difference when people were able to restore balance to the autonomic nervous system in terms of the medical outcomes. And even in terms of the diagnosis, because I would get people, you know, where they'd eventually conclude, oh, it's all in your head, okay, but we'd restore some balance, and then lo and behold, they'd find something, uh, because then that eliminated all the other effects that were coming from crisis mode, okay, and allowed it to, to become uh, clearer what was going on. Okay. So it pressures us, we put us in a hurry, okay, that's survival mode, okay, and it shuts down the maintenance. Okay. Uh, perception. The frame becomes more narrow. We see less of what's going on. Okay. We've got a lot, a lot of deer up where we live and we've got big windows on, on the south side of the house and there was a deer right in the front yard and I came up to the window and she stopped and stared at me and I just went like that and she just really focused on me. I could see the tension in her. And my dog came trotting around the side of the house and got closer to a deer than he ever had in his life because she was focused on me. That's what happens to us. Our frame shrinks. Our ability to take in information is diminished. Okay? Our filter darkens to what's wrong. Okay, and that mirrors what's happening in the thought because our mind is pulled to the question, what's wrong? Okay, and even if there's nothing wrong, okay, so I've just got a buildup of tension from the rest of the earlier day or last week or whenever, okay, my mind is going to be pulled to what's wrong. And I'll think of something. Oh, uh, I messed up yesterday or I might mess up, you know, the rest of this day or something. Now that builds more tension. That thought creates tension. Okay, the thought gets our body ready to do it, creates tension. Okay, so that tension narrows the focus more, pulls it more toward the negative. You've got a self-escalating process. Okay, and the focus becomes either fixed or scattered or both. Okay, it becomes fixed because we're focused on a threat, uh, but we're also reactive. So it's something over here, something over here, something over here. Where can it be? And so I can't find my keys. Okay, where, where, where are my keys? Okay, where, where did I put my keys? Okay, did I, no, did I give you, no, okay. Um, my keys are, um, well, I guess I'm just gonna have to stay here. I don't know what happened to my keys. Oh, now you find them, okay? That's what happens when we get out of balance, our focus jumps. And so I can walk past my keys three times and not see them. And it happens to all of us, because that's our, physiological, psychological reaction to escalating tension. Okay? Um, so our thought is pulled to what's wrong, and like I said, our ability to learn is diminished. So when students are stressed out, their learning goes way down. Okay? And that's what I see a lot in my class, is students report that they're a lot more efficient in taking tests and, and in, in learning with less effort. And there's a very, uh, a very good book, actually I bought it for both of my children. It's called How to Be a Straight-A Student, and I don't remember the author. But he basically uh, uses balance as one of his key components. And he did uh, research at the most difficult universities and found the students who excelled without stress and also had a social life. So he just pulled those students out and said, what do you do? Okay. And what they did was, the main, one of the main things they did was restore balance and maintain balance. And then they adapted to changing circumstances, okay? Which you're able to do when you're, when you're in balance because you're, you're pushed, that, that pressure hurry piece, you're pushed to, to drive harder and faster, which is exactly what you don't need because that's just perpetuating crisis mode, okay? And emotion, okay, the tension blocks the experience of the emotion. If you just, if I just keep on tensing my fist, eventually it'll fall asleep. It'll go numb. Okay, and I can prick myself with a pin, and I and I won't feel it. 
okay? Um, because we need movement for perceptions. Actually, I read a thing a while back, is if your eyes could be perfectly still, you would no longer see. Uh, because movement is required, so your eyes are always moving a little bit. Movement is required for perception, okay? And what tension does is it, it stops that, that movement in the, in the body. So we're, we're less able to feel our emotions because the movement of the muscles is actually the experience of the emotion. And because of the thoughts pulled to what's wrong, we create mental fear, okay? So if I have a buildup of tension, I'm going to be thinking about what's wrong what I'm afraid of, what could go wrong, what did go wrong, and again, we've got that self-escalating process where we're just continually to build tension, okay? And we're less empathic, we're less able to understand where other people are going because that's not part of survival, okay? I'm not thinking about what the bear is feeling when he's chasing me, okay? I'm just getting away from him, okay? And so um, we lose that capacity, and we also have a need for control, okay? Because that can give us a, a, a sense of safety. And so when, when we get into that tension, we're going to be more likely to control and we're going to more likely bump heads with someone else who's under tension who also has a need to control, okay? So that can escalate the, the whole thing and it can just keep on going. So our mind, the other thing that happens with our mind is that we're pulled to what worked before. Okay, as tension, so if I got away from the bear by climbing this particular tree, he couldn't get up, I'm going to see that tree and I'm going to be up it. Okay, I'm not thinking about anything creative or new or something like that. My mind is pulled to what worked before. And if you think of what's, what's happening, uh, terrorism is a good example. Okay, I mean, pretty much the obvious goal of terrorists is to create fear. Okay, and they also want us to attack them okay, so that they can be martyrs and recruit more people. So what do we do? We go back to what worked before in World War II and, and try to attack them, okay, and gives them exactly what we want. And we report all of the incidents in great detail again and again and again, creating this mental fear, okay, because that fear-based thinking has got our focus narrowed and is throwing us out of balance, and we're not stepping up and saying, okay, what are they trying to accomplish and how can we undermine that? Somehow that question doesn't get asked because our culture is just steeped in this fear-based thinking that comes from all over the place. One of the problems is it's a highly effective political tool. If you can make people afraid, they don't think about whether what you're saying makes any sense or question that you're just going to follow and you're going to look for a strong leader to protect you. Okay, and so there's a lot of problems that have resulted from that imbalance. Um, in our culture and, and in our world. Any questions about crisis mode? What goes wrong? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so what works? We start by restoring balance. Okay, physical balance. And, and I've mentioned this again, and, and that's why I've got this as a separate sleep, because that really is key. What I, there's a lot of techniques out there in terms of cognitive behavioral treatment and things like that where you change your thinking and, and you work with your emotions and things. But what I found is that those are extremely difficult when you're building tension in your body. And I've never seen a person come in for counseling who didn't have a significant amount of tension in their body. There was no one who came in in, relax, in balance physically. Okay. It didn't happen. Didn't see it. Okay. Um, and so... The body is the storehouse for tension and it's going to drive everything else. So the equivalent of trying to change my thinking when my body is building tension to me is like trying to turn a corner at 60 miles an hour. I mean, there are people who can do it. I mean, I've seen it on TV or in movies, okay, but they're highly trained and they're special conditions. Uh, most of us can't do it. I sure can't, okay. We, the rest of us need to slow down first. And when we slow down, when we restore balance, okay, now the rest of the things come online, okay? Now our emotions are available. Now we can think and we can reflect and we can discern and ask questions and look at what's going on. Our perceptions open up, our frame enlarges, okay? Uh, our filter becomes clear so we can see and understand what other people are feeling and what the situation is about, okay? So starting with the body opens up everything else, okay? So all of the personal resources that go offline when we're in crisis mode come back online when the body is in balance. Okay. 
Okay? So you're less likely to think about what's wrong when you're in physical balance. Okay? Questions about that? And I, I'd have to say probably 98% of the time that's what I wound up starting with when I was doing counseling. Uh, just because if I didn't, I would always go back to it anyway. And the only exceptions were where there was a specific problem where we had to do problem solving and dealing with that right away. But being in balance physically makes everything else easier. Being out of balance makes everything else harder. Simple as that. Anything you want to do is easier when you're in balance. Okay, so what works? Um, what works is to get your autonomic nervous system back into balance. That can take uh, anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks, depending on how out of balance you are. Okay, uh, but I want to explain really specifically what's going on uh, because it really helps to understand that process and know what you're doing. Okay, the major nerve that that feeds the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of your nervous system that does maintenance, is about the size of your thumb. Okay, it wraps around your esophagus and passes through the diaphragm. Uh, the diaphragm is a muscle at the bottom of the lung, shaped like a parachute. Um, and there's an opening in the back and the center of the diaphragm called the esophageal hiatus. And that nerve with the esophagus passes through that opening. Okay. And what I found, just from observation, because I, I, I picked up on, on this uh, uh, type of, of breathing early on in my career and, and, and studied it in terms of the experience of, of the people I was working with and adapted it. And what I found is the movement of the diaphragm, the rhythm of that movement is key. When the rhythm is three to four seconds down, three to four seconds up, okay, my understanding of what's happening is you're stimulating that nerve with the movement of the diaphragm. And they actually have an electrical way of stimulating that nerve that they've gotten some results from too, but this is natural and you don't have to hook yourself up to a machine to do it, okay? that activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which suppresses the, sy the sympathetic nervous system, and it works in less than a minute. Okay, I can see someone uh, who comes in, I teach them the breathing, and when I see that rhythm happening, okay, then I, can, I ask them, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling calmer now. And their voice changes, and I can see their perceptions are opening up. Okay, and when I worked at, uh, at Carroll, the residential facility, you know, with problems with people with violence, we would hold them in a basket hold, okay, when they're out of control. And what I found is their arm was right underneath their diaphragm. So I'm holding their wrist, okay, so I'm holding onto the wrist. I'm standing behind the person holding them like this, and I can feel their breathing with my chest. So what I would do is I would time their breathing, and when they exhaled, I'd pull on this hand, and then I'd let it up slowly. And I'd try to gradually slow it down. I'd create a little vacuum at the bottom of the lungs until I could get that. And this is one of the ways I learned that rhythm. Okay. And then I would let them breathe on their own. And then I'd stimulate it and let them breathe on their own and stimulate it. And I found that when they took three breaths on their own where I could feel that arm moving, I'd let them go. And I was never hit in four years of doing that work, not once. I would hold people three to five minutes on average. Others might hold them for as long as 45 minutes because they just keep on struggling and fighting. But once the parasympathetic nervous system was activated, I knew they weren't going to turn on me. That was the end of it. Okay? So it's, it's as clear and as simple and as powerful as that. Okay? One of the issues you have to deal with, though, are the stress hormones that get into your bloodstream. Because okay? that's what keeps you in crisis mode. That's survival. Okay? So you're getting away from the bear. Okay? Um, and what happens is your liver actually produces more sugar when you're in crisis mode. When you're in sympathetic nervous system crisis mode, you're producing sugar to give energy to your muscles so you can get more done, run faster away from the bear. Okay? When your parasympathetic nervous system is activated, your liver starts cleaning out your blood. And that's how you get rid of the stress hormones. And so I came up with the, the figure uh, four to six times a day Actually, I upped it to 6 and 10 because there were some situations where 6 wasn't enough. So now I say 6 to 10 uh, of doing the, the natural rhythmic breathing for 3 to 5 minutes that always restored balance. And that can take as long as a month in real the extreme outside cases where there was just an incredible amount of tension because you've got, first of all, you've got to master it, which takes some time. Uh, but secondly, you've got to activate it enough so that your liver has a chance to clean out your blood. 
because as soon as you stop activating it, your sympathetic nervous system is going to charge up again because of the stress hormones. So the more you do it, the more your liver works for you instead of against you, and the quicker you recover. Okay? So here's how it works. It's easier to show sitting down. Okay? And, uh, and actually, because most of my patients were sitting when I was teaching it. Okay? Um, but what I would have them do is to lean back a little bit. Okay? It's easier to lean back because if I'm forward like this, if you think about it, um, my stomach and intestines are pushing up against my diaphragm and it's just got more resistance. When I lean back, okay, the stomach and intestines drop down a little bit, it's just easier to move it. Okay? And if you put your hand right at the base of your ribs and sniff, like you're smelling some apple pie, something like that, it'd be nice on a day like this. Okay, that's your diaphragm. That little bumping under there is your diaphragm. So now just breathe in and allow the air to come to the bottom of your lungs so that muscle moves. And what happens is your belly moves out as you breathe in and comes down as you breathe out. And if you try to control it, okay, I'm going to get this right, I'm going to do this exactly right, it doesn't work. Okay? It's the natural way of breathing. You're restoring the natural way of breathing so you allow it to happen. And that in itself can take a few days of practice. Okay? If there's a lot of tension around the diaphragm, um, just allow that to work. And I have a, a video on my website uh, that, uh, and it was actually uh, a very fortunate thing because I had a, a nursing student who volunteered to work with me on the video and I hadn't met her before. But I had a sequence that I would go through with my patients when they couldn't master the breathing right away. Um, of different things that I would try and she actually could not do the breathing herself until we got to the very last step which is something I had only used like four or five times in the last ten years. Okay, so, so it was a real life situation on there that shows how to deal with the obstacles of that. So basically you allow the breath to come in and it looks like this. So there's no pause. Now what a lot of people will do will start to look like this. They'll go. So I'm also breathing up in the chest, which stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. Um, the way I was just breathing, I would say, was about 40% effective. So if I keep doing that, I'm going to get it. I'll get there. Okay, 40% is better than, than 0%. But it can take some time to do that. And the more you practice, the better you get at it. Um, and and it just simply effortless natural rhythm of your breathing. So it's called natural rhythmic breathing. Any questions about that? No? Sure. So, um, like a, a lot of what you're saying with the stress hormones and some of the research, you know, talks about um, in addition to the breathing, you know, like doing whether it's often bilateral movements, you know, walking, running, rowing that are bilateral, almost like echoing EMDR in some way. So do you, all, in addition to the rhythmic breathing, do you generally recommend any sort of physical, um, whether that's mild or moderate exercise no, actually, to yes. go along with it? Or do you, are you more focused no. solely on the No, breathing? that's the second technique. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm, what I'm looking for is, is, is what are, what are the underlying principles and the core issues? Okay, so I haven't worked with EMDR. I have worked with some people who've been through EMDR and, and had a, a, a follow-up break breakdown with PTSD and they fully recovered uh, after working through the structural emotion. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how that works. I don't know if anyone and, is. And I'm, but, I don't practice EMDR, okay. but from what some of the things I've read is that from the, the principle of it, right. it works on kind of connecting the different hemispheres of the brain, which seems yeah, to which is, be similar to, they say, like bilateral movement. Right, like which, walking, which cannot be proven in our current yeah. level of standard, yeah. which is nice yeah. speculation. Yeah. Um, but, but I, I'm interested in, more in what's the underlying principle. In terms of what's happening in the body, uh, my understanding of that is that tension always comes up. Whenever we are tensing, we tense up. It's right in the language. We become uptight. No one ever says, well, I'm down tight today. Okay? Okay? And so uh, this is the pattern. 
And what I found is reversing that pattern, okay, is, is what works. And uh, actually the first person I worked with um, when I had my first clinical job was in that residential facility, uh, Francis, and he um, had his eyes shut like this and he would go back like this, just screeching when he went back. And they'd pull his rocking chair all the way to the center of the floor and he'd keep on going back until he could hit his head on the wall. And then they'd pull him just when he got to the wall, pull him out again. And I had to assess him and, <laughs> and give him a diagnosis. Um, and I went to the meeting, I was just feeling totally, you know, ah, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And his mother and his sister were there and they visited him every month for years and he never opened his eyes for them, never acknowledged we were there, just continued to screech and rock back and forth and do this. And, and I had learned something about tension when I took a, a movement therapy uh, workshop when I was in graduate school. So I said, you know, I know something about tension, I'll try, he's got a lot of tension. Um, and just gradually work with him, but ultimately what, it, what I did was taught him to stomp down like that instead of come up like that. I also worked with his shoulders and arms and got him to relax a little bit. Ultimately was able to work with the breathing a little bit. I used kind of a sandbag and, and just, just do that. Um, and I worked with him every day and because um, I was new and I didn't know what else to do. Um, <laughs> I mean I had other work I had to do, but, but it was also the, the director gave us a lot of flexibility. And um, he opened his eyes again and, and was looking around and stopped screeching and stopped rocking back. And when his mother and, and uh, sister came the following month, he actually said, I love you to them. Those are the only words he ever said. Um, but he walked around, he was still you know, mentally impaired, he had brain damage. Um, but uh, that reversal of that pattern of tension ultimately was because he was trying to discharge like this and it just kept on, and I think it gave him a huge headache and he wanted to hit his head to try to get some relief from the headache. And so getting that down brings it down. So uh, when I had a preschool, um, when I was in graduate school, uh, I would have the kids uh, become gorillas when they started getting too up, you know, and it starts to get a little wild. Okay, let's go in the center of the floor and be gorillas. <laughs> and it would settle them down, literally. Okay, I mean, you can't really do that if you're, you know, in class, <laughs> you're getting stressed out. Maybe with preschoolers you can, okay. But what you can do is this, okay. And basically, the knees will always lock when tension is building. When I come out of balance, your knees, anyone out of balance will have their knees locked. And you're simply bending the knees does an awful lot. Okay, and, and the grounding, which is also, there's a video on it that, that goes into more detail on that on my website. But basically, what you're doing is you're lining up your body so that your skeleton is your primary support. Okay, my muscles have to work minimally to hold me in this position. And if I start to raise up my shoulders, I feel it and I drop them. Okay? Um, so practicing that position and what I do with when I when I teach um, in person and when I do with patients I have them stand and once they get the position I just have them bounce down which is the opposite of tensing up so you're activating the opposite muscles you cannot tense up when you're bouncing down and the muscles are going back into balance with each other so every 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 muscle has an opposing muscle so if I straighten out my arm these muscles have got to let go, these are doing the work. I bend my arm, these are doing the work, these have got to let go. When I'm bouncing, the muscles that tense up in reaction to, to tension, in reaction to crisis mode, have to let go. Okay? And that settles me down. And that has a very significant psychological effect. Um, it, you, can, you can learn to see when someone is not grounded, and it's, it's kind of like, I don't want to do it for very long because of the yeah, yeah, and, and also my head, and everything starts becoming conceptual, okay, and I lose touch with what's happening in, in the moment. But to the extent that I'm grounded, I'm much more aware of what's happening in the moment. It's very important in athletics and, and performance and dance and theater and things like that. Um, when people are more grounded, they'll give them a more effective performance. And actually, I used to work as a, as a professional clown in the late 70s and early 80s, and I made a list of, of uh, just the best performances, the ones that just somehow were better than all the others. And it's like, okay, what's, what did I do different there? What's common? And it was interesting, they all started late. Okay, it's like, whoa, what's that about? Well, I had done my warm up and I was ready to go, all set, and I had nothing else to do, so I just did more grounding, okay? 
Now here's another exercise that I do from grounding that, that I teach my students also on my website. Um, and basically in the position I'll show you, I cannot tense up without falling on my head. So my body won't let me tense up in this position. Plus it helps gravity to let go of it. So I'm working with the natural rhythmic breathing at the same time. Okay, let me turn sideways. It's probably easier for you to see. I'll do it out here. Okay. So I'm breathing down here. Let my head drop. So now I'm actually pushing my breath. You can see my breath in my lower back here. I'm pushing it to the bottom of my lungs so that I'm getting movement down there. And that helps those muscles to let go and to stretch. Now, if I can see my feet at this point, I'm tensing my neck. Watch what can happen if I can see my feet. See I'm tensing my neck? I need to let that go. Okay, so I go down as far as I'm comfortable. Stay there as long as I'm comfortable and then come up the opposite. Come up as I inhale. Relax as I exhale. And my head is the last thing to come up. Okay, so that just basically slows everything down, stops the buildup of tension, and puts you into the moment. Okay, and uh, at the end when we're all done, so those guys have a chance to, to pack up and everything, um, I can work with any of you individually if you have questions about either the breathing or the grounding and show you the, you know, show you the, the stance and ways that your, your patterns of tension, because we all have our own unique patterns of tension. Um, and so mine is back problems. I had a car accident, and I've got to always be aware of, of working with that. And so we all have it. Okay. So there's uh, haven't met any, anyone yet except newborn babies who are perfectly in balance. <laughs> okay. Uh, and they're just they just do it naturally. Okay. <clears throat> Questions about the body and what works. Oh, hang, like yeah. What you, what you just did, and just let it, let go. yeah, like a lemur hanging, yeah. dangling. And but the, but the principle that we're working with is tension is the problem, and the ways to get rid of tension are the solution. So there's all kinds of techniques out there in yoga and mindfulness. But if you look at what's underneath them, basically what's being effective, in my understanding, uh, I don't claim to be a you know, I've done research on this, I'm not a, a master authority, anything, but just from my understanding and my experience is what's underneath that is balancing the autonomic nervous system and reversing the pattern of tension. Those two are, are really uh, what's, what's powerful. Okay, so let's look at uh, what happens, what we can do with our perceptions here, okay? So once the body is in balance, okay, and this actually happens naturally, but we can also, once we're in balance physically, we can decide to do it. So I'm disagreeing with someone. Let's say we're having a discussion. Um, it happened the other day. I was talking to a guy about the healthcare system, and he had some really um, kind of fixed views on, on you know, what the problem was, and I had some differing views. Um, but I had to expand my frame to understand his views. Okay, and if I wasn't in balance, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Okay, so it allows you to have that flexibility. And when you have overlapping frames, now you can come to agreement. Okay, and once I understood his frame, then he was able to expand his frame a little bit into mine. Okay, and we came out at the end of it, you know, having some common agreement and some common ground. Okay, so that allows that because what happens is when we're building tension, it's being narrowed because of survival mode, because we're in crisis. Okay, um, the filter clears which means we can feel whatever emotion comes out of our perception of the moment and we can be empathic with someone else who's experiencing whatever emotion from whatever's happening with them and we can connect with them and have a much better uh, uh, likelihood of solving the problem and, and developing a, a healthy relationship with them. Our focus becomes more adaptable. 
Okay, we can, we can shift it. We can maintain the focus according to our priority. So if I need to, uh, last night I was, I was uh, going through the slides and fine tuning them and doing some changes. And, and so that was what was important I was doing. My daughter at the same time was doing taxes and kept on asking me, <laughs> okay, these questions about taxes. Uh, so I would have to let that focus go, answer a question about the taxes, and then I could go back to it. Okay, but I could not, um, answer her question while I was still working on that. The whole concept of multitasking actually doesn't make any sense in terms of how, our, how, how we're structured and how we operate. We're, we're a singular focus um, species, okay? That's how we operate, okay? And to the extent we split it, both of them are lost. And someone, someone somehow did some research where they came up with some numbers on it and it was like, if you're trying to do two things at once, you're operating about 60% capacity. If you're doing one thing, you can get up to 100%, but if you start splitting it. So if I'm trying to answer a question about taxes and prepare for this, both suffer. <laughs> okay, the significant. generation tends to be multitasking a lot of different things today. They've got their electronics, they yeah. do something, they're talking to somebody. And, and that's a concern. That's yeah. a concern. That's a very serious concern for me. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that uh, and, and our culture and quite frankly, it's more easy to sell someone something when they're distracted, okay? Because you don't then <laughs> go into, you don't go ask questions about, well, do I really need that? And is important? And how does that work compared to this? You, you just, you're, you're pulled in so many directions that it, that it, uh, it, it works against us. Um, so not that great. No, multi, actually there was a guy who wrote a, a scientific article. He did a fair amount of research on it. And the title of his article was "Multitasking Makes You Stupid." <laughs> okay, uh, it really so diminishes your that, diminishes your capacity. That it's really that humans at least are not really able to multitask. It's task switching, and instead of we're actually doing multiple things, we're just switching, switching. very rapidly. Mm -hmm. But we're still only really focused on one, one. thing. But yeah. we're still in a but the process of yeah. switching uses up our energy yeah. and disrupts our focus yeah. and, and we're not able to do it. Yeah, There was a, a, a United Airlines pilot in the 70s who was having trouble with his landing gear and kept on trying to figure out what was going on and, and to fix it and, and ran out of fuel and crashed his plane. Because hmm. the focus didn't, okay, it, it, it just, it just, uh, Oh yeah, no multitasking is right at the same time. Okay, yeah. 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 Uh, so so I'm going to I'm going to try to look at my notes while I'm talking to you and 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 right, yeah. see if I can make any sense right. and Okay. So it's not the idea of switching back and forth. Yeah. It's the rapid switching which is the Yeah, thing. yeah. If if I was willing to have a less inter less yeah. engaged conversation with you, I might get something out of my notes, but I can't do both. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, and if none of those if none of those are important, yeah. you know, it, it may be setting up a bad habit in other situations that hopefully wouldn't translate over. But if you're doing something important, uh, then you need your your focus about you. And what happens is is when you're you're able to choose that focus and then adapt it and and make it fit. Okay. So uh, what works in terms of thought? Okay, there's two techniques there. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to share that I didn't mention in, in what goes wrong with thinking. And I, I talked about how your brain works as, as a sequence of connections between neurons. It's like, it's like roads. And what happens, I mentioned how it gets more narrowly focused and it pulls our mind to what works before and it pulls our mind to simplistic thinking. Um, and particularly fear will trigger that, but that's basically the, the essential of crisis mode. But what happens is our thoughts our ability, to, our thoughts and perceptions, our ability to take in and process information, instead of being open and connecting to what's going on, becomes fixed. Because the roads, if we go down them, these are the only roads I ever travel, that becomes my definition of reality, and those roads become like railroad tracks. And all of a sudden, my life is defined by my tension, and I'm no longer free. And sadly, that happens a lot. 
okay, where we're just, this is reality, and anything outside of that doesn't exist or is evil or is stupid or ignorant or, or whatever else, and we get fixed in that. Um, and so we can also get fixed in a way of thinking that's creating more tension. Okay, I'm worrying about what's going to happen. I'm going to have to drive home tonight. It's going to be dark and my back's going to hurt. And, oh my God, what if I get in an accident? Now I'm building up tension, which makes it more likely to get into an accident. Okay, so what do you do with that? Okay, how do you stop that pattern? I've got this, this road that's paved that I just go on okay, easily every time. Um, two techniques okay, that I've found to be consistently helpful that I just always go back to. Um, one I call thought refocusing. Okay? So imagine your mind is like an empty field. Okay? You walk across the field, um, you can kind of see where you walk. If you go back the same way, you've got the beginnings of the path. If every time you cross the field, you take that same route, Pretty soon, that's where you go when you cross the field without thinking about it. When I walk to our neighbor's house, there's a path. The dogs used to take that path when our dogs were alive. That's how I go. I don't think about how to get there. I'm thinking about what I'm going to tell them or ask them or whatever. But I just go on that path. Okay, That's just how it works. And so these paths become entrenched. And as soon as we're in that area, we're just pulled to it. And we're pulled to paths that are more well established. So let's say this path in my brain was established by worrying and fretting and all of this stuff that's creating neg negativity. So in terms of my field, it's like mud and poison ivy. So every time I go to that part of the field, I'm dirty and itchy, but that's the only way I know to get across the field, and I always go there, so here I am dirty and itchy all the time. What am I going to do? Okay, well, first I can restore some balance to the autonomic nervous system, but I've still got this problem of the habit in my brain about this path. So well, let's look at our field. Let's choose a place where we can actually get across the field pretty quickly, in a few seconds, less than 10 seconds. Okay? And I'm going to choose a nice place that's got um, wildflowers and a nice view. Okay? And I'm going to decide that I'm going to go back and forth on this new path hundreds of times a day, if I can. Okay? So what, the way I do that is I repeat a short phrase. I call it a rhythm phrase. And that's because, ideally, it's a phrase that's in rhythm with your breathing. Okay, because you can always use this, the same frame, the same phrase to uh, focus your thought when you're practicing the natural rhythmic breathing. So I try to find something that I can do in that three to four seconds down, three to four seconds up in that. So you can say one phrase real slowly. You can say a longer phrase, you know, more quickly. So let's just take a short one, peace and calm. Okay, as I, I can't breathe and talk at the same time, but peace and calm, peace and calm. Okay, while I'm walking around, I'm saying it in rhythm with my walking. Peace and calm, peace and calm, peace and calm. If that's all I do, it won't make any difference. Okay, but if I do that every time I walk somewhere, if I do that when I'm washing my hands, if I do that when I'm in the shower, if I do that when I'm washing dishes, I can easily get in hundreds of times a day. Okay? And in my experience, if you do that within about a week to 10 days, you've created another path that is well, as well established as that negative path that was causing all of the problems. Okay? So as soon as I sense that I'm on this path, peace and calm. That's also now connected with my natural rhythmic breathing. I've created a pathway there, so I'm doing the natural rhythmic breathing and pulling my mind away from the negative thoughts. So I'm not walking on this old path anymore. So what happens to a path if you don't walk on it anymore? It disappears. disappears, yeah. And that's my experience, is that, that train of thought that created so much trouble just all of a sudden is gone. And now you choose where you want to go. So it's a, it's a transition, okay? It's a way to... To, to shift from those old habits that are causing problems to develop new habits that, that restore health. Okay. Questions about thought refocusing? Okay. Um, and it, it's amazing how we can get pulled in, I mean, without even knowing about it. I mean, I've worked with so many people where I've seen the effects of people who've Who's, who've gotten out of balance and gotten stuck and are well-intentioned people who, who tried to do good work, but uh, their patients really suffered. Uh, there was a, a young woman um, 
that I worked with in another facility uh, who wore a fencing mask all the time. She was in a wheelchair because she would continually try to hit herself. And so they just put a fencing mask on her to keep her from, from hitting herself. And so, you know, what's going on here? Started working with her and uh, got some staff and we, we put her in a room and I was trying to work with her on and see why, why, what was going on with her tension and, and she had a lot of tension in her legs and, and you know, what's going on here? And I asked, uh, uh, why can't she walk? Um, and no one knew, and um, all the physical therapy reports just said she can't walk. They didn't have any reason why, and so, well, you know, I feel like her legs are moving, okay, and, and she's letting go of some tension with this work I'm doing. Let's just see what happens, um, put her on her feet. She could walk. She'd been in a wheelchair for the last 10 years, okay, and she could walk. And the reason she was hitting her head is because she was so bloody frustrated that they wouldn't let her walk. And they were wheeling around everywhere, okay? Uh, but no one ever tested whether she could walk because the report said she could walk. She was in a wheelchair anyway, so you know she can't walk if she's in a wheelchair. That's what happens to our thinking. We just accept that, okay? Um, and it turned out, uh, going through all the old records, you had to go back and find them in boxes, when she got transferred to the other, from another facility to this facility, they put her in a wheelchair to make movement easier because she walked kind of slow, okay, and she just stayed there, okay. And well-meaning professionals did evaluations. And I worked with another young woman who um, was diagnosed as uh, severely mentally impaired and was in a, a, a care home with other people who were very low functioning and uh, she was at a, a workshop and she kept on bumping into things and stepping in front of things and no one could figure out what was going. They're trying to do all these sophisticated behavioral programs, taking away everything she liked unless she stopped doing it. And she just was getting more and more agitated. And, and they, I was doing just counseling with, with people of, of uh, regular intelligence uh, levels and they asked me to, to consult with her and um, we came in and we had a about a three minute conversation over the course of an hour. And it turned out that she had normal intelligence. But she had CP and no one could hear her or understand her. Okay, and she had had psychological evaluations. There were 20 psychological evaluations in her chart. Okay, <laughs> going back through the records that said she is severely mentally retarded. Okay, and we got her into a different home. We got her a computer that she could communicate with um, so that she, and she actually got her own apartment and is living independently, um, last I heard, okay. Well-meaning people got stuck in a mindset, okay, uh, that, that really diminished this person. And we don't know when we're doing that, okay. So we need to maintain and restore balance so we can ask those questions. What's she trying to communicate? I, well, let me slow down here. And, and, you know, it took me 20 minutes just to understood that there were some words there, okay? But listening very carefully and just coming, okay, now it's going out, okay? And, and it, it became clear. So, so the, the next technique frees our mind. Pardon? Excuse me, can I ask a question sure. about thought refocusing? Sure. Um, when I've worked with this with students, um, I encourage them to come up with a phrase that's meaningful to them right. to help them. But then when they come back, well, I can't decide. I get stuck between two or three. And, and so how do I help them kind of settle in on one um, or two? Or one, it, it, first of all, that? you raise a really good point because it's best to start with one phrase. Because if you're thinking about it, you're creating a new pathways. And if I have two phrases, I'm creating two. And if I have three, I'm creating three. So it takes three times as long to get them established. So stay with one for the first month or so. Once you have that one established, you can have another one that might fit a different kind of situation and, you know, um, whatever suits you. Um, but in terms of finding a phrase, one of my students described it as trying to pick out a new dress. Okay, <laughs> shopping around for it. So if you take it as an exploration rather than I got to do this, uh, and I also try to think of, okay, what's going on with that person? Um, what, what do they need right now? Um, uh, I don't remember the situation, but I remember giving someone a phrase uh, a short while ago, um, and what seemed to come out was, I am improving. I am, as you breathe in, improving. I am improving. 
I am improving. So, so because they were stuck in a place where they just felt like thing, everything was getting worse, um, but actually they were taking steps to improve so that fit with them. So, so listening um, can help them discover something. And worst case, you can say, try this one, peace and calm. Okay, that's a, a nice simple one. Um, you can take, uh, people will take a short prayer, they'll take a phrase from scripture, they'll take a phrase from a song, from poetry. Um, I had a 16 year old who came up with, um, actually peace and calm came from her. Uh, hers was moon and stars, peace and calm. Okay, um, and so just, just whatever. But it's, it is helpful to come up with your own if you can. Uh, but if they can't, it doesn't matter because the function is to get another pathway and once they get that pathway established, they find a better phrase, cool. So use this one until, for a month until you get a better one, is what I'd suggest. Yes. Okay. So the next technique that gives you that mental flexibility that allows you to, to shift and see things from a different perspective and to back up and to see the larger picture is meditation. Okay. And there are hundreds of different kinds of meditation. Uh, but again, what I'm interested in is what is the core thing that meditation does? okay, in terms of balance. Uh, meditation does a lot of other things in a lot of different ways. There's a whole spiritual component to meditation. There's does a lot of things. But the type of meditation I'm interested in is how does it help me restore balance? And fortunately, it was the meditation form that I learned back in 1972 and I've been doing every day ever since, okay? And it's just a simple meditation of working with the breath and repeating a sound as I breathe. Okay, so I started out actually with transcendental meditation where they gave me a sound to repeat and, and I don't remember they taught us to do it with our breath or I just started doing that. But then I switched and, and I tried two different meditations after that. And I, I talked to a teacher and it made a lot of sense to me who said don't switch without a good reason. So I, I, I do that carefully. So you stay with the same sound, okay? So, you're, so the, the two sounds that I use in my class uh, one comes from yoga, um, uh, and it's uh, so as you breathe in, hum as you breathe out, okay? And those words mean this and that, so you're not chanting to some unknown deity or something like that, okay? Um, but it, it's, so it's a neutral meditation if, if people are concerned about that. I also teach a Christian meditation because a lot of my students and patients are Christian, and it's called Centering Prayer, and you just repeat the name Jesus as you breathe very slowly. Jesus, Jesus. So what's happening is you're repeating this sound, okay, as you breathe. You sit with your eyes closed, okay, feet flat, okay, minimum amount of tension. And just start repeating that sound, okay? So my mind is focused on that sound. And it might take two seconds, it might take a minute or two, but I'm going to get distracted. Now I'm thinking of something else. And people say, oh, I can't meditate because I'm too distracted. That's like saying, I can't swim because there's too much water. <laughs> okay? Distractions are what you're working with. That's what you're there for. Okay? So you get distracted, and I might get distracted for five minutes. Oh, I'm thinking about this, and what am I going to do here? Oh, what happened there? Oh, I'm distracted. Let it go. Come back. Distracted again. Let it go. Come back. Get distracted again. Let it go. Come back. Distract it again, I go, go back. That can happen hundreds of times in 20 minutes, okay? Um, each time, I'm creating a pathway in my brain where I'm letting go of where my mind is being pulled and focusing where I choose. And that is an invaluable skill. Now you are free. Your mind isn't being pulled by all this external stuff or internal stuff as a result of external stuff or tension. You decide this is what I want to pay attention to. And it's an ongoing skill that deepens. I liken it to brushing my teeth. Um, I actually, uh, I remember about 10 years ago, we went on vacation and I just thought, you know, I'm just gonna take a vacation from meditation. I've been doing this for 35 years and, you know, I'm just gonna take a break from it. I'm not gonna meditate this week. And three days later, it was the mental equivalent of not having brushed my teeth. You know, it's like, I'm not going to take a vacation from brushing my teeth. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> and I just could feel that my mind wasn't as clear or as flexible, and I just started getting, you know, I just didn't like it. 
Okay, I mean, it wasn't that it was uncomfortable or that there was anything negative about it, but I just realized having clean teeth is much nicer than not having clean teeth. And having a clear mind is much nicer. My fishing goes better. I mean, you know, everything is better when my mind is clear. Okay, so it's an ongoing thing, and, and uh, 20 minutes seems to be a, a standard kind of practice. Uh, half an hour is good. I found that a half hour continuous, unless you're on a retreat or for some other kind of reason, I haven't found to be helpful in terms of developing the skill. Um, five minutes is helpful. Ten minutes is a lot more than, than helpful than five minutes. 20 minutes is a lot more helpful than 10 minutes, but if all you have is five minutes and you get it established in five minutes, it's worth doing, okay? So you just simply sit in a relaxed position. You can do it laying down if you like. If you do it laying down, you're more likely to fall asleep because you have a habit of lying down, closing your eyes, and falling asleep, but whatever works for you, okay? You don't want to do it with a lot of tension. So whatever, so your body is supported, okay? We're just working with the mind. I mean, there are, there are there's a good case in yoga for do you using a certain posture, but they're doing other things. All I'm looking at is the mental balance, how to achieve the mental balance. And for that purpose, the positioning is less important. Um, you just want to be able to breathe in the natural rhythmic breath, okay, and you pair the sound with the breath. As soon as you're distracted, you let go, come back. If you're not distracted, you just stay there. You get this very peaceful, calming feeling, which is very nice and you don't try to hold on to that. I just take that as, as a gift, it's a side effect. And if you try to maintain that feeling or find that feeling, then it doesn't work, <laughs> okay? That's another distraction that you wanna let go of. Anything that takes you away from that is a distraction. And I also keep a notepad with me because I get a lot of really good ideas while I'm meditating, and so I just write them down, that's a distraction, let it go, go back. It's like, because I don't remember it if I don't write it down, okay? and that might just be me, but you, it has to be practical and has to work with who you are and, and in your situation. But I'd have to say it's probably the single best thing I've ever learned in my life. Uh, I can imagine um, going to a counseling session without having meditated that day any more than I wouldn't go without taking a shower. Uh, it just uh, is part of clearing my mind and giving, allowing me that freedom to, to see things in a, in a clearer way, and, and working in counseling, that's critical. You've gotta be able to shift gears and let go of where you're being pulled and step back and see the larger picture and, and, the, and the relevant details. Okay, um, so emotion, I'll say, well, the other thing is, is when you're using, when you use these techniques, then you have the capacity to clarify and choose, okay? You can look, step back, see the larger picture and the relevant details, and decide what's most important. You're not pulled, your focus isn't narrow, you've got a larger field to choose from, okay? And, and you're in less of a hurry, so you can anticipate what's gonna happen. You can ask those questions and clarify, so you see where you're going and what might come out of it, okay? And then what happens, uh, what works with emotion is actually quite simple. You just restore balance to mind and body and allow the emotion to run its course, okay? So what happens in counseling a lot, when people come in and they'll start to cry and they'll go, they'll tense up, okay? Pull their legs up, so I'll just say, put your feet flat, let your shoulders down, keep breathing, how it comes. Now that may take a little while depending on how much tension is and their comfort level in letting that happen. That's to be respected, um, but ultimately, that emotion then just comes naturally, okay? Um, and what I have found uh, working with people with, uh, who've experienced severe trauma is when they are not resisting the emotion by tensing or breath holding, okay? So they're, they're in physical balance, okay? The, um, the, the emotional release tends to last less than 15 seconds. Um, it's just the body lets go of what's there and then recovers. So um, now that in PTSD, that happens again and again and again. And uh, on the outside, it can take as long as a year uh, to recover from full trauma. But so I'll give you an example. I, I worked with a guy who uh, he'd been in Vietnam, uh, suffered some horrific things and also had done some horrific things and um, came home and got married and got a job and raised a family, no problems whatsoever, retired, moved up north, 
started having flashbacks, nightmares, life turned to hell. Okay, he came to, to uh, came into counseling. I explained to him how the emotions work and how to get back into balance, and uh, and he experienced some things. We did a little bit of clarifying in terms of, of things he had done because he needed to sort through that. Um, but he was driving over an hour to come to the sessions, and it was the same kind of thing. Plus, I tended to be booked quite a ways ahead. So I said, you know, uh, you understand how this works, and he went through the session, was able to to let go a couple of times. So we'd had, I think, five sessions. And I said, call me if you have any problems, and if I don't hear from you, I'll call you every two weeks, and let's just keep in touch until this is resolved. And so he calls me up, and he said, you know, it happened just like we talked about. Okay, I was sitting on my deck, I was just relaxing in the sun, afternoon, no problems, nothing at all, and someone's behind that bush gonna blow me away. Just, just like that. Okay, so what I did is I put my feet flat, I breathed, and I had a horrific 10 seconds, and then it passed, okay? And that's been my experience consistently if you're not resisting the emotion, okay, uh, that it just passes, okay? And then you, then you can shift your focus. Now, if you start thinking about it, talking about it, so one of the pieces of advice I give is to separate the thought from the emotion, okay? Don't think about what happened. Just let it, it's, it's a normal response to a traumatic experience. Allow the emotion to run its course. If you start thinking about it, now you're creating the same thing again. You can keep that going the rest of your life and make it worse while you're doing it, okay? So you just let it go and it passes, okay? And that's the resolution for the structural emotion as well as any emotion that comes up in our day-to-day -day life, okay? Uh, if we're in a situation where we're not able to, to uh, experience it, this often happens when there's a sudden loss or even a loss that we anticipate. Uh, you know, so my, my sister's husband died and, you know, she was kind of, I mean, she knew it was going to happen. He'd been sick for a year, but there was just this numbness and this shock for the first couple of weeks. And I told her, that's okay. You know, it's going to come, okay? But, uh, and I spent a lot of time with her. I talked to her every day and spent some time with staying down with her, but the emotion would come up, okay? She'd have a memory, have a good cry, it would pass, come up, have a good cry, it would pass, come up, have a good cry, it was pass. Now she's fully recovered, created a good life for herself, is happier than she's ever been uh, since you know, her husband died and, and is doing really well. Okay, so that emotional thing just runs at course. It's a natural thing. If you don't feed it with the thoughts and don't block it with the tension, it runs its course and you're fine. And now your emotions are open and you're able to be empathic with others and understanding what's going on and make those connections that, that uh, keep us going. So, uh, we gradually resolve the structural tension by separating the emotion from the thought. Yes? So, did I hear you right? For example, if there's a tension at work or something that at the end of the day and you, know, you call a friend or family and you vent about it, sometimes it's good, but it's not good to repeat it, to relive your day when you have Yeah, here, here's the good part. Here's the good part is you are connecting with your friend okay, by sharing an emotion. They're feeling what you're feeling and you're making that connection. You can do that in a couple of minutes, okay. Now if you start talking for a half hour, okay, about everything that everybody did, you're creating more emotion and probably more tension because you're creating it probably faster than you can resolve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's helpful in terms of that connection. It also can be helpful if I'm hesitant to hold in my emotion, so this is what happens in counseling. So they talk about what's going on, okay, and that brings the emotion up, but now it's like let go of the tension. So immediately, as soon as someone starts experiencing an emotion in session, you know, here's what happens. I mean, it's variations on this. So it's the same thing. Put your feet down, let your shoulders down, get your breathing down, just allow it to come, separate the thought from the emotion, uh, it's a normal response to something that's happened to you, okay? Uh, thinking about it will just keep it going. Let it go, okay? You're doing exactly what you need to be doing. Allow it to run its course, okay? Uh, so that process of getting there uh, in terms of talking about what happened is minimal and many times never happen. I mean, I, I've worked with dozens and dozens, if not hundred or more people who never told me what the trauma was. Okay, um, uh, I didn't need to know. This reminds me of an inspirational talk I saw. I was at a public speaking group, Toastmasters, and someone just wrote a speech um, about um, basically her phrase was, 
if somebody hit you on the head, why would you take that same board and keep hitting yourself on the head with it over and right. over again? You would not do that physically, so why do that emotionally? Right. And that really... Yeah. Because, because we, we equate emotion with thought. Mm -hmm. And somehow if we analyze and understand it, so if I, if I understand, uh, you know, like you teach marketing, right? So to the extent I understand marketing, okay, I'm going to be better at marketing. So that analysis and breaking it down, if something goes wrong with the marketing, I need to analyze it and understand it. Um, but that's thought. And emotion, in my understanding, is a totally different process. Um, and so each has its place. And when you start mixing them, uh, then you create, you create problems. Um, so. Any other questions about that? Okay. Okay. So, what health looks like? There's a snowball that happens as tension builds. I described that to you, okay? Uh, it starts with tension on some level, whether that tension came from thoughts or perceptions or in blocking emotions, doesn't matter. But the body starts building tension, the mind gets pulled to what's wrong, the emotions are blocked, the perceptions are narrow. Each of those things escalates tension and it continues to snowball. The good news is, is restoring balance also snowballs because each one makes the other easier. Okay, particularly when you start with the body. So when you're not building muscle tension, okay, first of all, you can have a quick recovery when there's a stressful event. Okay, something can happen, you feel it, you let it down. Okay, but if I'm already tense and something happens, rah, okay, okay, I can then explode. Uh, in terms of emotion, I call it the sunburn response, okay? When there's a lot of tension, okay, you just react. It's just like if I slap my leg, okay, it stings a little bit, it's going to be gone in a couple seconds. My hand actually stings more. That too will be gone. But if I would badly sunburned and I just went like that, it's like, ah! Okay? So recognizing when someone is sunburned, okay, which I can do when I'm in balance, keeps me from reacting with my own sunburn, okay? Because when you get two sunburned people in a tight space, you got a lot of problems, okay? So you want to give some space. And when you have that balance, you can see it, and you can recognize it, and you can choose not to go there, okay? So, so when you're not building tension, you recover more quickly. Naturally, you will get more sleep. You'll wake up when you're rested. Okay, uh, I would set as a goal, uh, I think, which would be a wonderful, it was a universal goal to rarely use alarm clocks, okay, <laughs> that we know when we have to wake up and go to bed that many hours before and have a regular routine uh, because most people, quite frankly, are sleep deprived in this culture. Uh, and there's very clear research on sleep. There's really not much question about it. Um, people who have been awake for more than 18 hours uh, perform at the same level on problem-solving tasks as people who have been legally, who are legally drunk. Okay, um, people who have gotten less than six hours on average sleep per night for a week perform at the same level as people who are legally drunk. Okay, it just diminishes us, but because it's building tension, what happens when we're short on sleep? We create more energy to keep us going. My body is saying rest. My mind is saying no. You got to keep going puts me into crisis mode, creating more tension than I'm using in the situation that I'm in, and it just keeps on escalating, okay? So we want to snowball that in the other direction, restoring balance. Now I realize how much better I feel when I sleep. I change my routine. I let go of things that interfere with that, and now I start getting ready to sleep. I realize I function much better when I eat on a regular basis. Okay, um, it's amazing. I've, I've worked with a few couples that are people that were hyperglycemic. There was one couple, all we did was um, <laughs> have a snack when you get home. Because <laughs> they got into an argument every night fixing dinner. <laughs> it's like, well, have a snack. And they called and canceled their next appointment. Said, we're fine. Because <laughs> they were both hypoglycemic. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, in terms of emotionally, uh, you can allow yourself to feel the full experience of emotion without breath holding. And if that's not appropriate in the situation, you have the flexibility to shift your focus so that emotion isn't blocked or stopped. It just stops being stimulated. 
Okay, so it fits with the need of the motion. What happens when we maintain balance is we are using the energy that's produced for the moment and we fit with the moment. We're not creating excess energy, we're not out of energy, everything connects and is fitted. Okay, so that means we're not building any tension when there's an emotional experience. So we can have uh, a severely, you know, loss that, that we're all going to face. I mean, if we don't die first, someone close to us is going to die, and we're going to have a severe loss that we need to deal with, and all kinds of other ways of of dealing with things like that. And we deal with them in a way that doesn't build tension when we're in balance. So so that's helping us to maintain balance. Okay. Um, our thoughts, uh, we recognize when our thoughts are going in a direction, that's one of the real benefits of, of meditation, is you can see, well, where are these thoughts taking me? Okay, oh, that's not helpful. I've been there before. I know that road. Okay, that's just simply not helpful. It may be very logical and reasonable, and, and they really may be at fault, and that's their problem, but going there doesn't help. So I'm going to back up, and I'm going to look at it this way. Okay, and I'm going to look at what is helpful. Okay, well, what's happening that they did that? Oh, now I see. Well, they're sunburned about that, and now I can deal with it in an effective way. I've got that flexibility, okay? And our concentration then becomes effortless based on our interests and priorities. It isn't like I have to force myself to study. I want to study because I want to do well, because I want to learn the material, because it's interesting, and I also want to do well on, on, in the class. Okay, so, so the motivation also matches the situation. So uh, people say, you know, I don't have the willpower to do this. Um, and what I found to be really helpful to say, it doesn't take willpower. It takes clarity. Because with willpower, I'm trying to push extra energy in the situation. I don't have the energy to get it done from whatever's happening in the moment, so there's tension blocking that on some level. So I'm trying to force it. And I'm just going to exhaust myself if I push myself at some point through that willpower. Okay? But if I simply see clearly, okay, uh, I want to lose weight. And this is hurting my back, and it's interfering with my health, and maybe I've got a heart condition. I'm just making this up. Um, so now I've got the motivation, and it's clear that if I eat a more healthy diet and lose some weight, that my back is going to hurt less and my heart's going to be stronger. And so the motivation is there, and clarity is what you want rather than willpower. Okay, it isn't driving or pushing yourself to do that. It's just seeing clearly. And that's, the bottom line is the best motivation. Okay, seeing clearly. And you're able to see clearly when you restore balance which then opens up your perceptions. Your frame just naturally becomes more flexible. And you can choose in a situation to extend it a little bit so you understand someone with a differing point of view. Doesn't mean you agree with them, okay? But you can understand where they're coming from. And your filter is clear so you can understand the emotion. Um, one of the, the people I worked with early in my career um, had molested a six-year-old girl. And they brought him over from the jail. And he walked in and said, I did it because I needed to. What are you going to do? Ooh. <laughs> I, I just, I had to stop myself from clenching my fist because this, this is what I like to do. And he was just in my face. I mean, he was just, ew. And I, it took me a month of working on myself to be able to restore balance with him and expand my frame and to look at his life and where he was coming from. How could he get that frozen? Okay, and the obvious thing was, then became clear to me, he himself was molested as a child. And so that closed his heart and narrowed his frame. And without saying that, but just realizing that, the next session, just out of our conversation, he broke down and cried. Okay, because he realized his own hurt, which allowed him to realize some of the effects that what he did, and, and he was able to work with that. And he's probably still in prison because he got a life sentence. Um, uh, but I still have hope for him because knowing the effects of what he did means that he's, he can heal and, and build whatever life he can under those circumstances. Okay? Uh, but without being able to get into his frame and see through his filter, nothing would have happened. Okay? So that's a, that's a critical piece of it. It opens up the, refresh, the, the perceptions and allows you to focus um, where you can be most helpful. Okay? 
So it's a continuing interaction, a snowball in a healthy direction. And what happens when we get into a healthy state is we get into what I call flow. It's not just my term. Lots of people have used that term. But it's, it's where you're fully in touch with the moment and things, you see it in, in athletic events. Most obviously, we're, we're an athlete like Michael Jordan scoring 60-some points okay, in, a, in a game where he was just hitting every shot he took. And I saw, him, I saw it on TV, and he, he ran by someone and was like, I don't know what's happening. But he's just, he was just totally in touch with the moment and producing exactly the energy he needed to do what he did, and everything had a flow. And I really believe that in many respects, that's our natural state that that flow, that connection with the moment and with each other and what's going on is when we're fully and totally in balance. Okay? So I want to leave you with a, with a story. Um, back in uh, 1991, this is a true story, I planted a, a, a bunch of trees actually um, uh, in our property. We bought 15 acres up north and I, and I built our house up there. And um, planted this little dogwood tree and uh, in the back meadow among a bunch of other trees. And that's the, I had an accident that, uh, that year and hurt my back and then we had a drought and, and so I didn't water any of the trees, didn't take care of them and most of them died. And I just figured, no, oh, too bad. Well, 17 years later in the spring, I'm walking through the area, it was in our back meadow so I didn't get back there a lot, but I was walking through and I see this little bowl because I always made a bowl when I planted a tree so the water would run down into it. And here's this little dogwood tree just about the same size, and I go to bend it, and it's still alive. It doesn't break. It's still alive. So I dig it up, and I take it to our garden, which is fenced in, and it has good, rich, organic soil, and it's got a drip irrigation system, and just to see what happens. And my wife says, why are you planting that chewed up spindly stick? And I said, this is the dogwood tree that I planted, you know, 17 years ago, and somehow it's still alive, so I want to see what it'll do. Okay. Well, now that dogwood tree is over eight feet tall, okay, and it's covered with flowers in the spring. I look forward to getting back up north because it's probably going to flower out pretty soon, okay. And then it gets these white berries in the in the winter. And uh, a couple Christmases ago, there were ten cardinals, five pairs of cardinals, on that dogwood tree having Christmas dinner, okay, of, of all the white berries, okay. So I ask myself, what's the true nature of a dogwood tree? Is it to be a little chewed up spindly stick? No, that was its adaptive nature. That's how it adapted to a lack of balance. That's how it adapted to ongoing threats from the deer and the rabbits and the drought and the weeds and everything that was, that was causing it. And so it adapted that in order to survive. That's what a dogwood tr tree does in crisis mode. So then I ask, well, what would happen to us? Okay. Could we be the human equivalent of a chewed up spindly stick? Because we've been living with an increasing lack of balance year after year and decade after decade. And actually there was a, a, an archaeologist who did research and wrote a book and found that there was no significant evidence, evidence of human to human violence in the first 95% of human existence. It's only been in the last 5%, the last 5,000 years or so. Uh, that we've, there's evidence of human-to-human -human violence and hierarchy, where you have some people buried under pyramids and other people in a ditch. Okay? No evidence of that before that. And what happened during that time was there was a worldwide drought, or a drought where most of the humans were. Okay? And, and some tribes started attacking other tribes, and this conceptual fear, or mental fear, started becoming a part of our life, and we started living out of balance. So what would happen if we just started, if we all made a commitment, one at a time, one by one, talking to our friends, sharing the information, if we all got into balance? What would human nature be like if we did that? Okay, thank you. Appreciate your all coming. And if you have questions or if you want to stick around afterwards, happy to show you some things about the grounding or the breathing, anything like that. Thanks a lot.